somebody hold me too close. Somebody hurt me too deep. Somebody sit in my chair and ruin my sleep and make me aware of being alive. Being alive. Somebody need me too much. Somebody know me too well. Somebody pull me up short and put me through hell and give me support for being Being Alive, Bernadette Peters. And welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vretos, and I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College and Yeshiva University here in New York. An article in The Atlantic once stated that America appears to be the only country in the world where love is a national problem. It went on to say that nowhere else can one find a people devoting so much time and so much study to the question of the relationship between men and women. Nowhere else is there such concern about the fact that this relationship does not always make for perfect happiness. The great majority of Americans of both sexes seem to be in a state of chronic bewilderment in the face of a problem which they are certainly not the first to confront, but which, unlike other people, they still refuse to accept as one of those gifts of the gods which one might just as well take as it is, a mixed blessing at times, and at other times a curse or merely a nuisance. Love in America. It's as if the experience of being in love could only be one of two things. Superhuman ecstasy, the way of reaching heaven on earth and in pairs, or a psychopathic condition to be treated by specialists. By the way, for full transparency, the Atlantic article was written in 1938. 1938. It's as relevant today as it ever was. How does love work, survive and flourish in the face of an America whose democracy is increasingly threatened daily by a neo-fascist administration whose rhetoric and policies are creating lives of catastrophic pain and trauma for so many? Love is seen as needing to be perfect, in fact, and there is nothing better. But like our democracy, it's struggling to survive the onslaught of hate and treachery. How does one love and our democracy work in a society increasingly traumatized and viciously dysfunctional? Now, many radicals and leftists are fond 
of quoting some of the ruthlessly cynical polemics from Marx's writings on love and marriage. But his personal views were much more traditional and romantic. Marx married his childhood sweetheart, Jenny von Westphalen, and stayed married for life. He also took a close and traditional interest in the marriages of his daughters, Jenny and Laura. The following is an excerpt from Marx's youth in a letter to his father. Please give greetings for me to my sweet, wonderful Jenny. I have read her letter 12 times already and always discover new delights in it. It is in every respect, including that of style, the most beautiful letter I can imagine being written by a woman. In his doctoral thesis, Marx writes, simply as a matter of love, the wife of the individual is cherished deeply in his heart. He wants to be assured that the wife is somewhere in sensuous spatial existence, even if things are going badly with her, rather than she does not exist at all. So comrades, there's a little side of Marx you should also take into uh, our studies. Now to help us in these contradictions and questions, we are totally thrilled to have on the Radical Imagination today a nationally recognized author whose book has inspired and helped thousands of people in their marriages and in their choices of healthy relationships. She's a skilled psychotherapist and sex therapist, host of the Ask Beatty Show on Progressive Radio Network, and most importantly for me, my forever and beyond wife and life partner who makes my being alive a joy and love-filled adventure every day and night. Welcome, Beatty Cohen-Vretos, to the Radical Imagination <laughs> Sweetie it's Pie. It's great to be it's here with you again. It's great to be here. Again. And just to lighten it up, yes. after the introduction, yes. before our discussion, mm -hmm. briefly, here's Bob Dylan singing, Tonight I'll Be Staying Here With You.
throw one's troubles out the door. Tonight I'm staying here with you, being alive. I mean, you are the expert on relationships. You've been a psychotherapist, a sex therapist for many years. You've seen it all. I've seen and it all. And isn't the yes. central thing love? Yes. Love, yes. isn't it? We're all looking for love. There's no question about it, Jim. And it's it's complicated. And it is seems it? Is it? It, <laughs> it, it is. It is. I mean, most of my patients are, are online and they have to deal with things like ghosting and breadcrumbing. It's a whole different world. And yet, you know, I, I, I tell gotta, people. I, you go, go ahead in just a second. But yes. I must admit to the audience and to you, and you know, it wasn't complicated for me, but okay, go ahead, go ahead. I just want. I, th I think that <laughs> love that. has always been complicated, and I think it's How a so? lot. Well, I think finding you, that 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 person who you can love and trust and and and, and, and respect, and and really want to make a lifelong commitment to. I think that. Uh, it's always been a challenge, and yet I think today, Jim, I think it's a lot more challenging. I mean, most of the people mm. that I see as an example, right. uh, they're on their computers. They don't even go anywhere. They don't make the face-to-face -face connection that, that we made when, mm. when, when we were kids mm -hmm. and when we first met. So people are, are hoping and, and wishing and, and dreaming that somehow somebody is going to swipe right. But I mean, we can't blame it all on technology, no, right? No, of, of course not. So but, it's, but technology has actually changed the, the dynamic. Hmm. I mean, there, there used to be, as an example, um, a learning uh, course here. And I, and I used to teach live here in, in, in New York City. And, and now uh, the course is, the live course has been uh, discontinued and people are trying. The learning annex. The is learning it? annex. That, and it was a that's course right. on, on how to meet well, or, or there love were many partners. Courses. Yeah, there were, many there, courses. There were, there were many different you know, kinds of courses. Okay. But even now, I mean, oh. college courses, who would have ever dreamed that you'd be going to Harvard or some of the Ivy League uh, schools and that so many of the, uh, the courses now are online and it's that connection, that face-to-face that, that, mm. that -face connection that people need that you know you can talk about Facebook and, and, and Facebook Live, but it's, it's, it's different. And I think that people are becoming, and certainly I hear this in my practice mm. every day, more and more um, frightened, I think, that right. they're not going to be able to have that happily ever after story that we all want, even though there's yeah. always ups and downs right. in the best of happily ever after stories. But to back up what you just said, who writes love letters anymore, like Marx did? People don't know how I to mean, read. Uh, uh, they right, don't I know mean, how to write. Well, <laughs> uh, uh, well, how to express oneself to another human being um, in those intimate ways. It's and changed. The joy and, and I mean. Um, People text. It's, yeah, it's, it's one yeah, word, yeah, one word yeah. or one letter connection. So it's more, again, an impersonalized society here that we're talking about, more and more impersonal and and uh, technological and, and so on. Yes. Uh, and yet that we're we fighting through. And yet, this, as, as Bernadette Peters is singing, we so much need each other to feel and be alive. Ab absolutely. And I mean, I really believe you can meet people everywhere and anywhere, and yet, you know, I'm on the subways frequently uh, going to the Progressive Radio Network studio to do my Ask BB show. And I look around, Jim, and everybody's on their phone. Yeah. People are not connecting in any ways. They're connecting with their phones. So that with my own patients, I, you know, I really encourage people to, to get out, to yeah. go to live venues and, and to say hello and take some risk. And of course, it's, yeah. it's risky because you, you never know, know what's going to happen. You know what, that in, in just a couple of minutes, that's a great segue because we want to... We have a short little clip with uh, Dr. Carol Gilligan, Dr. Jim's, Jim Gilligan. Good friends uh, of ours. Good yes. friends of ours and, yes. and, and uh, psychotherapists, psychiatrists, so on, <coughs> about the riskiness of love. Mm -hmm. So if we've got it queued up, let's see 
a very small, uh, a, a short excerpt on why love is so risky, and then we'll have you comment on that. No risk, no gain, right? Right. Right. <laughs> right. So get out there and risk it. Our relationship is it's just, it's like the tide. It's always moving. It's alive. And the minute you try to freeze the relationship where you get scared, that, I mean, it's true. It's in life. Somebody could always die. Somebody could leave. I mean, you know, exactly. it's like things happen. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a huge risk to love somebody. And... Um, it's very dangerous in that sense. On the other hand, if you try to control love or a relationship, you destroy it, you kill it, so. To control a relationship destroys it, and it's, it's so risky to trust. And yet, our friends, the Gilligans, they've been married for over over 50 years, right? Over 50 right? years, yeah. Yes, yeah. and, you know, as they, they have talked about so frequently, that they've had many marriages, mm -hmm. you know, to each mm -hmm. other, mm -hmm. you know, within, within their marriage. And I think that couples have to be very creative and that we have to continue to redesign and our challenge each and other, challenge each point, other yeah. and redesign our our relationships you know but i go back to you know what i have really found over the past 35 years jim and that is is that if we're going to be able uh and this is what i have found clinically this is what i've found also personally to to hope to have a successful long-term love relationship each of us have to be in a really good place ourselves, emotionally yeah. and psychologically and psychiatrically. Because if we're waiting for the prince or the princess to somehow, you know, rescue the damsel or the, or the man in distress, what I find <coughs> is that we're going to be waiting for a very, very, very long, long, long time. So that we have to be, we have to be in a good place ourselves. We have a responsibility, I believe, to work through as best as we can, even though we can't change history, our unfinished business, our skeletons in the closet, our depression, our anxiety, our early child sexual abuse, our dysfunctional family of origin. After all, we, we don't get to choose our, our, our parents. So that we are, in fact, I, you know, I used to, to say to my patients all the time, uh, the relationship, it's the icing on the cake. Mm. We need to be the foundation. We need to really mm. be the cake. And then what happens also is that people, particularly these days, I find, have absolutely no idea what ingredients really go into a successful long-term relationship. So there is Why a learning. Why is that? Why they're not? Well, they're we're get, not getting it from school. We right. don't get it. They, we don't get it in the schools. Uh, so few people, I think, were really lucky, and it, it's luck to have grown up in a functional, loving, yeah. two-parent family. Yeah, 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 so we yeah. see less and less of, of that. Those and then you role look, models. And right, and, uh, and then you look at what, what Hollywood pres you know, presents to us. I mean, talk about dysfunction, mm. you know, the housewives, the, the reality shows, uh, you know, getting married in 90 days, meeting your... your, your you know, potential spouse uh, at the altar, you know, marriage at 90 first days, sight. they do it that long? Yeah. I thought it was, um, uh, we've seen... Well, 90 days. 20 then, days. Or and there's a show, and then there's the show, well, Marriage at First Sight. At where, First Sight, yeah. You, you yeah. don't even know the person. You don't even yeah. meet the person until right. you're at the altar. So things are complicated. Things are complicated. And yet people are, are falling in love and and Or thinking married. they're falling in love. Well, they are falling in love. They are. And they're getting How do you married. know when you are? How do you know when you are in love? Well, of course, uh, you want to feel trust. You want to feel a connection, an emotional connection, a physical connection, a sexual connection. And that takes time to mm. play out, which is, of course, which is what my book is all about, you know, how to assess who's right for you and who's wrong for you, At you know, before you can Im commit. Yes, and I think you really do have to play it out for at least a year unless it's very, very clear that you need to exit the relationship very, very quickly. So right. it takes time to find out about who a person is and who a person is, is, is not. 
and communication and problem solving, the two keys, the two most important ingredients that actually make or break relationships. And there needs to be a sexual uh, attraction. And of course, people have to understand that there are always going to be ups and downs in the best of relationships. And people have to learn how to be able to deal with the tough times, and this is where emotional communication and problem solving are so critical. But you have to put yourself out there. And of course, as Carol and Jim Gilligan say, it, it's risky, and yet, if you don't risk, there's no gain. But you're gonna just give up. Right, and, and let's make it clear too, what you're talking about is, is getting involved in a serious way, committed, mature. We're not talking about right. hooking up here, and that, which is all fine and dandy. If that's you're talking about, people who are interested in some sort of right, committed, long-standing relationship. Is that right? Absolutely, basically? and that yeah. it holds true whether or not you're gay or straight or trans or not, right. rich, not, poor, not, or rich or poor, or race, or religion, educated so or on. not. And I think that most people will tell you that. <laughs> We want to be in love, we want to love, and we want somebody to love us. And in the final analysis, and I always quote, you know, on my radio show and on other shows that I do, the Harvard study. There was a major, major Harvard study that followed 100 men. I don't know why it was just men, but they followed 100 men for 75 years. And which was an amazing thing, because most studies do certainly not last for, for 75 years. And they asked these men, in the final analysis, what have you learned? What is the most important thing that you have learned <coughs> throughout your life? And what they said, Jim, it was love, it was connection, it was not the bigger, better, more, the mm. money, the trips, the yachts, the planes, it was nothing like that at all. It was about love, and connection. And people have to understand that those are the things that are the most important things in life. And to get a little philosophical about it, which we will also when we see the Cornell West clip, but before okay. that we'll, we'll also uh, in just a couple minutes see Jim Gilligan talk about love in the soul because um, as he points out Cornell um, Dostoevsky and, and Hamlet, the greatest hell is defined as the incapacity to love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You point out that we want it, and yet if we can't, we don't have the incapacity, if we're, we're unable to, it's a living hell. And, and uh, let's listen to Jim Gilligan, a very short okay. little excerpt here on love and the soul. Sounds good. The human soul, the human psyche, needs love in order to survive, just as specifically as the body needs oxygen in order to survive. Uh, and for people who haven't been starved for love, that, that may not be the first thing they would think of. I mean, we kind of take it for granted that we get love from a lot of people. But if you have lived in an environment where you were starved for that, um, you're talking about a different, whole different range of experience. Just like with somebody who's starved for oxygen. I mean, most of the time we don't even think about the air we breathe, it's just the air we breathe. But when somebody's oxygen supply is cut off, you realize it's life-threatening in, in a very short time. Well, the same with, with the, the, the prisoners. They were like people whose oxygen supply had been cut off, but it was their love supply. And I realized that without love, the soul cannot survive. It, it dies. And that's what these men were telling me. Their souls had died. That's why they were capable of killing other people. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, our souls are dead without love. And of course, it all begins in the beginning. You know, if you happen to be unlucky yeah. and you grow up With in a family parents, yeah. where you did not receive love. I mean, I have a couple of patients right now who were emotionally and physically and, and, and sexually ab and verbally abused throughout their entire lives. And they've been, you know, at a loss of what to do. How, how can I find a soulful, healthy, 
functional love. And so oftentimes what happens is that you repeat what you experience. So with a couple of the women, they continue to, to look for love in all the wrong places, mm -hmm. just as they had experienced, you know, when, when, when they were growing up. And yet I, I want to leave people with good news. I mean, there are all kinds of things that we are able to, to do to work through the issues from our past and to be able to really live in the moment in a healthy way where we can reach out and where we can find healthy love and, and, and not be allow ready for it. and be ready for it yeah. and not allow the fake news or the bad news <coughs> to really dissuade us and, uh, and then subsequently you know, get us in a place where we're just going to give up. I mean, there are people out there, there are good men, there mm. are good women. I mean, I hear constantly that there are no good men in New York. I mean, it's, it's absurd. And, it, and of course, it's because that so many of these women have had very painful experiences so oftentimes, you know, beginning mm. in their mm. own family of origin. Mm -hmm. But there are good people. But first, we have and to the men as well. And the men as, and, and the men right. as well. I mean, you and I, we were at a, a luncheon recently, and I was talking to some, you know, of the progressive men who are doing some major things, mm, leadership mm. positions, and uh, over lunch, they may not have said this to you, Jim, but they said <laughs> this to me. They were lonely, and mm. they were wanting love, and they were wanting what Jim Gilligan was talking about. They were wanting that connection. And it's great to be an activist. It's great to be a professional. It's mm. great to make money. It's great to, to do all kinds of things. But in the final analysis, we want that loving connection. You we, hear all we about want that, it. all the Marxists out there, too. <laughs> Carl was looking for it. No, you're absolutely right. It, 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 it's absolutely true. Right. And, there, and there isn't a substitute. And in fact, I was... Uh, I was doing a, a segment on my radio show a couple of weeks ago, and uh, loneliness now is yeah. the number yeah. one epidemic <sighs> in the United States, over and, ab of and, uh, and above depression and, and anxiety. When, and there are more people right now that are suffering from true clinical depression and anxiety at levels that we've never seen before. And we're talking about some very deep feelings of loneliness, of, of really feeling so existentially alone Absolutely. in the world that it's almost unbearable. It is unbearable. And if you think about it. And yeah. I, have, I have a patient right now and she tells me that she is on the phone during the night contacting uh, suicide hotlines, contacting anybody yeah. so that she will be able to experience some human connection. Hmm. She tells me that she'll go out on the streets. She will do anything. She'll drop something and hope that wow. maybe somebody will pick up something wow. that she dropped so that even for a second, she will experience a human connection. So if people are finding that they're in this sort of state, they absolutely, they need to mm. reach out and ask for help. And good help can really transform the way one, you know, deals with themselves, with the way one deals and processes their their early experiences. Once you have that initial connection right. with with the therapist in this case yes. you're talking about, and then you can have some sort of rebuilding exactly uh, that Gilligan is talking about here. A absolutely. That you, you ha begin to have that capacity to give in love exactly. once you've been given and, and, and validated to a certain extent. And that, that's one of the, I think, the key ingredients that really needs to go on in, in good psychotherapy. I mean, I've written papers on this that love is the primary thing that I believe will really ultimately, um, you know, see whether or not the therapeutic experience is going to be helpful or not. There needs to be a love connection. I mean, obviously not a sexual love connection yeah. or a romantic love connection, <coughs> but a connection where you feel that somebody really gets you, where somebody really understands you, where it's safe for you to express at least at this therapeutic level, exactly. and then you can go on further Ex exactly. out there and, and out there in the world and, right. and make that reality check or, or meet people that can give you exactly. uh, back what you're looking for. Exactly, because if you have those blocks, sometimes it's really, really hard to do it on your own. Yeah. And reaching out for help, it's, it's not a weakness. It is a strength. 
and it can and, and it does transform and it'll change your life and relationships forever if you're with the right therapist. Yeah. Now, as you know, I'm a sociologist. We're involved in social movements. And mm -hmm. we're going to put Cornell West on just for a minute, he, in, in just a minute. Our good friend. Uh, okay. Yes. And, and he's, this is a five-minute excerpt on, on catastrophic love and the traumatization of people, large groups of people within mm -hmm. a culture mm -hmm. that doesn't care, that has never cared, and how one can somehow in the face of that, in the face of this existential catastrophe and, 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 and lack of validation and, and love and so on, how you can still meet that, that condition, that experience with love and radical love. So here's Cornell, Kay. and then I'm very interested in seeing and hearing what you think about what okay. he said. Oh, here he is. Here's Cornell. Okay. A woman is someone who begins with the catastrophic. See, the blues is autobiographical chronicle of a personal catastrophe expressed lyrically. So it's a lyrical res response to the monstrous. It's like the first sentence of Kafka's A Metamorphosis. Gregor Sampson grows up from uneasy, I mean, wakes up from an uneasy dream, finds himself transformed in bed to a huge, vile vermin. That's catastrophic. That's catastrophic. The situation of poor people is catastrophic. Black people had slavery, Jim Crow, Jane Crow, catastrophic. What was the response? What didn't create a black Al-Qaeda? It wasn't counter-terroristic. In the face of slavery, Frederick Douglass said what? With a smile and wounds, we want freedom for everybody. We don't want to enslave others just because we're enslaved. Jim Crow, we have no rights and liberties. We're civically dead. We want rights and liberties for everybody. Right? We don't want to Jim Crow somebody else. The blues responds to the catastrophic with compassion, without drinking from the cup of bitterness. Not with revenge, but with justice. That's the best of the blues, you see. And so the blues people in America have been the leaven in the democratic loaf because black people could have chosen counter-terroristic tactics when they were lynched over and over and over again. They said, no, we're not going to go out and lynch white folk. We would rather be defeated for the moment with integrity than win and be a gangster like them. That's a blue sensibility. That's a blue sensibility. So you let that love inside of you be expressed even though it's hard for it to be translated into love or justice on the ground. That's a great lesson in this age of terrorism and in the age of recession, you see. And so some, a blues man like myself in the life of the mind, a jazz man in the world of ideas says, I want to tell the truth. The condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. And as a Christian, I believe in unconditional love. That's why I love Brother Larry Summers. I want him to have more joy in his life. It's hard to have a lot of arrogance and have a lot of joy at the same time. I want him to have more joy and less arrogance. But unconditional love is always tied to justice. Justice is love on legs spilling over into the public sphere. No, I mean, it's just a different institutional array of uh, sources of what a blue sensibility. Now, keep in mind, by blue sensibility, what I have in part in mind is a tragic comics view in which compassion responds to catastrophe. See, in that sense, Walter Benjamin is a blues man in the thesis on philosophy of history in the ninth thesis. You see, the history is catastrophe of pileage of records upon records, that pile of debris, but the response is messianic, is weak, but the messianic is what? To keep alive the memory of those who struggled before based on their compassion for the poor, you see, based on their attempt to resist the powers that be. So that by blues, I don't mean just a particular uh, art form. It's really a way of life that that art form helped popularize. So even in the media, in the, in, in the context of the media, you, see, you can be a blues person without even being able to sing. Because you can have a tragic comic sensibility that keeps track of the catastrophes all around us. It could be personal catastrophes, heartbreak. It could be the shipwreck of the mind, intellectual catastrophe. It could be social catastrophe, crisis. It could be Wall Street, catastrophe for the well-to-do and others. And then the catastrophe that's always in place for the poor. Always at work with housing, education, unemployment, and so on. Those 60s sensibilities where people had 
a love for poor people. It wasn't a condescension of helping out. We had a love for poor people. We love poor people's music, like Curtis Mayfield. We love poor people's music, the genius that came out of the ghettos, the Donny Hathaways and others, you see. Uh, uh, and it was also true on the other side, the Bruce Brit Springsteen's, the, uh, the, the, the white blues men, out of the working classes of New Jersey, you see. Uh, and they weren't geniuses because they're working class, but they were extraordinarily ordinary people who happened to be geniuses in their genres. And that was the Sly Stones, everyday people who we love. Everybody's a star, Sly Stone. Uh, uh, that's what shaped and molded me. And I am old school to the core, unapologetic. Motown, Stax, Philly, International Sound, Curtis Mayfield, Al Green, Aretha, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, uh, Leroy Jones, transferring into Baraka, but especially allowing, because as a Christian, I start with black people in terms of my love, but it spills over to white brothers and sisters, brown, red, yellow, across the board. So I believe in spillover love. And since justice is what love looks like in public, you can't talk about loving folk if you're not fighting for justice, especially beginning with the least of these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unconditional love in the face of catastrophe and trauma, whether it's macro level, economic, political, personal. Tough to do. Tough to do isn't what your therapeutic process, what you're trying to do with so many, and have done, with so many people. Isn't that what you're at least partly about to? I think whether or not you're talking about Jim Crow or, or, or racism or early child sexual abuse, I think that people have to be willing, and I think most people really are not able to do this on their own, to be able to go back and emotionally process all of this, whether it was their own personal trauma, whether or not mm. it is societal trauma, so that you get what to a point. What does it mean when you say that process? To, Help ta our audience to talk about it, to cry about so it, to be angry to about let it, see. to let it out, to, let it out to, to verbalize it, to, to, to not be afraid of to it, to not, not be afraid of it. it, to look at it in all kinds of different ways, mm. and maybe you're going to come up with a different perspective than perhaps you had initially. And when you go through this process of, of, of all of the different emotions that people feel, again, whether or not you're talking about personal crisis or whether or not you're talking about existential crisis or whether or not you're talking about political crisis, you're then at a place where you're in the moment rather than having you know one foot in the past and one foot in the present and then people really have to make a decision about what are we going to do now it's all about Once you sort of get your head straight yes, enough yes yes and what can and i do and heart and emotions and then yeah what is the what next step what am i going to do what is the what next step what do you step? do with that maybe yeah. it's joining an organization like the poor people's organization dr barber's organization Maybe it's, 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 it's reaching out and doing some volunteer work. Maybe it's getting involved in a variety of different kinds of, of, of social movements. But you have a clearer sense of what you want to do after you really go through the process of all of the different emotions and, and feelings. The inner struggles. The inner struggles. And then it's about what are you going to do? Yeah. What are you going to do? And, and connect. Again, it could be even one person. Right, right. Or with, as you say, volunteer or... or become that would get out of yourself. To get out of yourself. To, 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 to become maybe a foster parent. To become a big sister. To decide that you're going to... Maybe you need a religious experience. So maybe you need to join a church. Or maybe you need to get involved in a synagogue. You, you have a much better sense of all of this once you've been able to work through your own ambiguities, yeah. your own ambivalence, your own fears, your, your, your own hurts, your own pains. And then it's a process of moving forward, Jim. Otherwise, we just kind of stay stagnant. But it's, as you point out, it's moving forward with love. Love becomes the healing agent of as you reach out to others who are touched by now this newfound love, if you will, and you yourself feed back from that, get back, get feedback from that, and, and that love grows in you. Too. 
Well, you know, let's let's take what's going on with the you know Trump presidency okay. you know, right now. People are are angry. They are beside themselves, and yet it's about what are you going to do about this? You can talk. You can be angry. You can be upset. But what would be something that would really be functional to do? Well, maybe you want to connect with a Dr. Barber. Mm -hmm. Maybe you decide that you want to become more involved um, in a third party that you may never Move have it. even considered before. Right. Uh, maybe, I mean, there are all kinds of things that people would be able to consider after, after they go through. Artistically, or writing, artistically, singing, music. Yeah. Yes, ex ex exactly. All exactly. kinds of possibilities that never occur to you unless you become open. Right. Your heart becomes open. Right. Otherwise, we can get very stuck and yeah. very, very cynical. And it's not helpful for us emotionally, psychologically, Absolutely. physically. You know, it can, it can destroy us. Absolutely. So, you know, there are realities and we, you know, we can't just assume that everything is going to end up perfectly well, but there are things that we can do after we work through our own emotions, our own disappointments, whether it's about our family of origin, whether or not it's about our friends, whether or not it's about our, 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 our station in life. We, ha we have to go through that process and then come to a point where we're able to say, what is the next step? What am I going to be able to do now to improve the quality of my life, the quality of my relationship, uh, the quality of what is going on politically? What can I do? And it's in the doing and in the so connection yeah, yeah. that people start to feel better. And therapeutically, this can take a little bit of time because can. there could be people who have, uh, you've given some examples of some of the people you've seen, I mean, been severely traumatized for many, many years. So this is not something that's gonna just change overnight. Exactly. But, but the power of redemption, redemptive love, if you will. Yes. Um, and therapeutic love uh, that Gilligan and you are talking about right. is remarkable. It's very the human, healing. The human psyche is so resilient in, in some ways too, right? Yes, but we need to find people who can support us that's and, important. And, yeah, and, that's and very important. And it may be at a given time in life, it may be just your therapist. And that's okay. Right. Right. That's right. okay. And that's, of course, what we've also added that dimension to this show is love in a time of hate and treachery. Right. And, and, and the ratcheting up of that hate and treachery at so many different levels, as Cornell puts it, poor especially, but for all of us. So you're right, that how does one survive and, and blossom and flourish? And still in the face of this, uh, Cornell talked about unconditional love. Mm -hmm. In the face of, and he talked about uh, Larry Sumners, who gave him that hard time in, at Harvard there. And he says, I, I gotta love my white brother there, even though, and he's hoping that he can be somewhat more joyous too. So that's what we've gotta open up people's hearts. And, and, and that's what you're, try to do, and you do it so well uh, as a therapist. And in the giving, we get so much back. In fact, there was a recent study done with uh, nursing home residents, and there was one group that they were given the task of taking care of plants. And of plants? Of plants. Uh -huh. And the garden. Yeah, yeah. And the other group had uh, their aides water the plants and, mm. and, and, you know, and tend to the garden. And it was a very interesting finding that the people who were giving and who were tending, they actually lived a lot longer statistically than the people who really didn't have anything to do. Yeah. And, you know, we live on the Upper West Side in, 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 in New York City, and I see so many people everywhere that have dogs. And the mm. not only do the dogs give us back so much, but we're able to take care of them. And in yeah. the walking of, 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 of our dogs, there is so much interaction and connection that mm. happens with all the other dog owners. And yeah. I was frequently, you know, saying to people, you know, maybe a really good idea if, if you're lonely and you don't have a partner and you don't have love in your life right now, to get a dog who you will love 
and who will obviously love you back. And, and, and in you know, being able to meet people. And so there are many different ways that we can go about trying to meet our soulful needs for love. And you were so fortunate yourself to come from such a wonderful, loving community in, in Winnipeg. In Winnipeg, and Canada, when, yes. And you're Canadian, which is, a, as you pointed out a number of times, kinder and gentler. Gentler, kinder, and, and yes, we are. Um, and, and that's what we're talking about. How do we bring about more individuals and a culture that is more caring and giving and loving? And as you point out, it may have to be, at least at first, through the therapist. Well, if there's if there's nobody else, Jim, right. if you don't have family, if you if you don't have friends, and you know you're just with yourself and by yourself day after day after day, that will kill you. The loneliness, the loneliness will will will, will kill you. Let me ask you personally: How do you, in the face midst of a very difficult profession to be in, how do you? keep your incredible <laughs> buoyancy and energy and, and life energy, which I feed off of and, and love so much and, and feel so blessed to experience day in and day out. Well, how is, how, where do you get it from? Look, viewers need to know. I mean, we have an incredible marriage and it nurtures me every single mm. day. And of course, I, I love what I do. I mean, my work is, is my passion, but also mm -hmm. I play a lot of tennis. Yes, you I do. I keep very, very active. I walk cha-cha, the dog. dog. The dog, that's what you she's know. talking about, the dog, yeah. But in the, yeah. In the final analysis, and yeah. this may be a very you know, anti-feminist statement to make, for me, it's mostly about the love that yeah. we have been able to, to build yeah. in our marriage. Yeah, it's, it, it it makes all the difference in the world. It, it makes really, really all does. the difference in the and world. And everything else falls yes. into place. So it's... Yes. Um, gosh, so, so tell me your thoughts about how we can become a more loving society and, and bring about the sort of um, energy that you are talking about. Other than, well, you've talked about therapeutically. Um, I mean, let's not... Forget too. Th therapy doesn't work all the time, right? I mean, there's. Um, I think that giving back is really, really important. I think that so many people we want to take, we we yeah. want, we yeah. we want, but in the giving back and in giving of ourselves, we get so much back, and it becomes a love connection, whether it's with an animal, whether or not it's doing volunteer work uh, and that's that's the beginning I think if we if we if we don't have the family if we don't have the friends it's like what getting a plant getting a pl getting, getting a, a goldfish. plant yeah getting something Just to life to right, life that we can care about yeah that we can really care about and and that Hopefully, we're then going to be able to to get something back. And there are, you know, all kinds of, of organizations, the twelve step programs, and we mm -hmm. have to we have to sort of push ourselves. Even though, you know, I say to people all the time, you may not feel like doing this, but if this is going to be something that's in your best interest, we have to push ourselves to acknowledge what is going to be in our best interest, what is going to be in our worst interest today. And every day, and I was lucky, I had a yeah, father yeah, who used to say, it's a, it's a new day. And you can strike out today, whether or not it's on the baseball field uh, or, or anywhere. But tomorrow is a new day, and let's put together a plan of action, not right. just a plan right. of rumination, right. of what we can do today. And if you're not sure, then again, give yourself permission to, to reach out to a coach, to a therapist, to a minister, to a rabbi, to somebody who can mentor you to be able to then take the next positive step for yourself. Absolutely, and in the face of the toxicity and treachery and hate, right. increasingly more of the side, that is the answer. 
It is the answer. It is the answer. Yes. And now, you have a show on Progressive Radio Network I that people do. can listen yes, to. Yes, it's the it's Ask every, Beatty Show, yeah, and yeah. it is on it? live, live every Monday from 3 to 4 on the Progressive Radio Network. Right. There is also an archive section, and last Monday was my 224th Ask Beatty Show, and I really welcome people to uh, call in. You can call in live. You can text me. You can go to my BeattyCone.com website for any contact information. And I just love being here with oh, you. This is great. Sweet pie. <laughs> Thank you so much, so much, so much, so much. I love you, to love you. And we're going to end with a clip appropriately. Um, Otis Redding. Okay. Try a little tenderness. Sounds good to me. Try a little tenderness. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, B.D., for being on the show today. We'll see you all next week. Uh, again, next week, this is Jim Vretto's saying goodbye for the radical imagination. And here's Otis Redding, Try a Little Tenderness. Oh, she may be weary Them young girls, they do get weary Wearing that same old shaggy When she gets weary, try a little tenderness. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, that. Mm. You know she's waiting, just anticipating for things. She'll never, 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 never possess, yeah, yeah. But while she's there waiting, and without them, try a little tenderness. That's all you gotta do. It's not just sentimental, no, no, no. She had her grief and care, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the soft words they all spoke so gentle, yeah. It makes it easier, easier to bear.